Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. I'm, uh, I'm keeping an eye on the world and the times that we're living in and praying carefully too what God wants us to, to address here on Sundays. And uh, as I was meditating with God and reflecting on his word and just praying with him, um, and I thought about Easter coming up. And so we're, we're doing a, a series on the road to the cross to, to fix our eyes on Jesus in the day that we're living in right now. But what's interesting is, is the message that God gave me has some end times connections in it quite a bit. And so I'm just praying that God uses this message to speak to us, to prepare us. You know, when you see everything going on in our world right now, uh, and, you, and you actually, this is what I'm experiencing, I'm having unsaved friends and, and people in our world even waking up to the fact that, whoa, maybe there really is an end of days coming. And when you have the secular world noticing that <laughs> and starting to ask questions, you know that... <laughs> it's time for us to make sure we're awake too, right? <clears throat> and we could, we could focus on all the crises and all the things going on right now, but let's not forget that we need to be ready ourselves for the Lord's coming. <clears throat> but we also need to be ready for those who are now asking questions and coming back or coming to the Lord for the first time or coming back. So we're gonna be looking at Christ and the people that he talked with throughout his road to the cross leading up to Easter but we're gonna start with how he was even brought in, uh, to announce into the world through John the Baptist. So go to Luke chapter three. Luke chapter three, and the parallel scripture would be Matthew three, but it's not the same uh, exactly. So we're gonna be using Luke three because he gives a little more detail. And I wanna, I wanna I pray that we will let this scripture prepare us for the days that we're living in. And I'm praying that anyone who is, uh, is not a Christian, who's unsaved or unbeliever, that you will be, have a soft heart to receive this. As Christians, let us have a soft heart as well to receive uh, this message as well, if there's anything that we need to change in our lives. And you're, you know, I, I kind of chuckled because this message is heavy and we're going through a lot of heavy things right now. Um, but church, can I just, can I encourage you that, um, that we need to be ready for the heavy? Um, I've had people say, hey, things are really heavy. I need an encouraging message. Um, you know what? Praise the Lord. Uh, thank the Lord. You can read the Bible every day and be encouraged by God's word. But we need direction from God more than anything. And we need his word to teach and, and, and speak to us. And I praise the Lord for cra uh, crazy good, really good encouraging scriptures <laughs> that I can read every day before I ever get to church. But this is what God wants us to hear today. What I've been sensing from God is get ready. Prepare the way, make a way, and, uh, and repent. Prepare yourselves. And so I'm being obedient to the Lord to bring this message to you today. Um, and it's in his word, and you can read it over and over again many times in the gospels of the word repent and being ready for his return. So let's get right into it. And pardon me as I try to pronounce these Roman Greek names. They're not easy to pronounce. Verse one, it was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Iturea and Trachonitis. Lysianias was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas, or Caiaphas were the high priests. I did pretty good there, didn't I? I did, I did. It was pretty good. Yay! At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. So this is John the Baptist. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Matthew uh, chapter three talks about these words and, and the, the words that Matthew uses is repent 
for the kingdom of heaven is near. So John says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him, the valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level, the curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. Why? Then all people will see the salvation sent from God. It was the coming of Christ. John the Baptist, uh, we, this is great. Pastor Ben, the missionary, he, he led us right into this series because he brought up John the Baptist and his father, Zechariah, prophesying over John and Jesus about them coming. And John the Baptist was prophesied in Isaiah that he would say these things, that he would come on the scene before Jesus would come on the scene. And so this was a sign for the people at this time that Jesus really is near. And the Messiah is on his way. And so we better prepare ourselves and get ready for his coming into our world. Now, John, he, he was out in the wilderness preaching. I just want you to picture this for a moment. He's wearing um, camel's hair for clothing. <laughs> Probably looking a little scruffy, living out in the wilderness, eating wild honey and, and, and locusts. And I thought, how would we receive him today? Who's this guy coming out of the back of the woods at Walmart, you know? <laughs> but they were actually going to him, going to the Jordan River to hear him preach. And you can kind of imagine, you know, today, maybe he kind of maybe looked homeless because he lived out there in the wilderness. And then the, the thing, whenever I read this story, I, I think about the people on the corner of New York City who hold the signs, repent, with the fire. Why do we always draw fire around that? Like... Well, there, there is a reality to what they're saying. So, you know, it just seems so often, though, that we, um, the church can be judged by that one person on the side of the road who's saying, repent, repent, always calling out sin, but never calling out the hope of why you repent. So I'm praying today you hear that in our sermon. And I pray that we will communicate both the repentance and, you ready for this? that when you do repent, you find the forgiveness of God. Because that's the point. So he's, he's saying prepare the way, and uh, he's saying repent is his main message, um, and he's the one who's supposed to prepare the way. What does repent mean? Repent means to have a change of, of heart and mind, but also to have a change of behavior as well. So he's saying, turn away from those evil things and turn to God. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you do turn to God, it's implied that you must turn away from evil. Now, some people try to marry the two together and they don't work, do they? It's like oil and water. Something's going to be separated and rise to the top. So when we say repent, when, when John says repent, he's saying abandon your old way of life that's selfish or thinking of yourself or pleasure and sin and turn to God for the forgiveness of your sin. That's what that word means. The hope of that is forgiveness is on the other side of that repentance. Praise the Lord. That's the good news. And to clear the road, what does that mean? Well, they would send messengers ahead to towns and cities as the king would ride in and they would say clear the road get rid of the debris get rid of the brush uh, any potholes in the path fill it in make it smooth traveling long distances back then was already hard so make it a little easier for the king to come in so john john was called to go before christ and tell everyone make yourself ready for jesus to come into your world, make yourself ready. And so that was his role, that was his call, and that was his message. Now, that is not so bold and harsh. I mean, I think, I think we could handle hearing that. By the way, Pastor Ben could tell that you love the word and that you're okay with real honest messages, and I said, yes, we have an amazing church here that wants the truth of God's word. But I didn't expect to read this when I was younger for the first time, the next words of John the Baptist. So verse seven, when the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, you brood of snakes. Ooh, 
Wow. Who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? Now, just so you know, um, sometimes we can interject our own personality, our own upbringing into things, but we do need to understand this. According to Luke 3, and just so you know, John was a pretty strong, bold man, and God used him mightily, right? Sometimes you need those people to come in and kind of clear things up and be honest and real with you. But in verse 2, it says, at this time, a message from God came to John. Now, this wasn't John making this stuff up. John was speaking for God. So this is authorized by God. He's a prophet speaking, just so you know. And, and he says a really strong statement here, but there's a good reason for it. There's meaning to it. Um, the picture here is that there's wrath or fire coming. And so now the snakes are scurrying away from the fire in the field. I don't know if you've ever set a, a, a farm on fire. I, I hope you didn't. But a, a lot of things come scurrying out to avoid the wrath of the fire. And so what he's saying here is, is, who told you to escape this? Why are you coming out from the coming wrath? So there's the picture and the image there of that. Now, verse eight says, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Wow, this is a, this is a heavy message, isn't it? You're probably thinking right now, hey, Pastor Ryan, you know we lost an hour of sleep, right? Like, hey, you know, the world is, is looking pretty messed up right now. Well, it's a bold message, but it comes with the good news in it. And this was a very confrontive plea to them uh, to not rest on the bloodline that they were of Jews and that Father Abraham's righteousness must pass down to ours automatically, right? Right? So we're good because we're a Jew and we're part of the chosen people of God. And that was a false security that they held on to. And what we think, scholars think, is that they were following the custom. Oh, this is a new custom. Let me go ahead and get water baptized. But their heart wasn't in it. And so John's confronting that. And also, you know, you can't rest on the, uh, the inheritance or the promise of the chosen people just because your father Abraham, the one who they respected so much, was righteous doesn't mean you're righteous. And so now John's confronting them saying this must be a personal, personal response and this personal response must not be just a ritual. It must prove itself by the way you live. Now, this is a strong message, very confrontive. They actually took it really well. I mean, every pastor's dream. This is what it says next in, in verse 10. The crowds asked, what should we do? What should we do? It worked. John's honest message worked. What should we do? And now John gives them, here's, here's the proof of your repentance you ready? If you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. So in other words, be giving to the, to the common everyday townspeople that were out there at the Jordan River listening to him. He was saying, hey, if you have truly repented, if you're truly sorry, go and do this now. By the way, just so you know, uh, I called my, my scholar dad, Pastor Kuhn. And my mom, who's also, I trust as well. And we don't see many places in the gospel where it says to apologize. There's a lot of forgive one another, but where's the apology? The apology is when we repent. How do we say sorry to God and then show him we're truly sorry? We repent and then go do what's right. See, repentance is this, when you have the chance to go do the same thing again, you don't. 
You don't return to that sin. Instead, you rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. You follow the the Spirit's leading and you do not go that way again. Instead, you do what is right. That is to say and to prove you're truly sorry and you're truly repentant. And by the way, you can do that because you have the power of Jesus Christ living in you and you've been set free from sin. (laughs) Amen. You can. I'll share some stories of it happening in a moment as I get through this. So he says, be generous, be giving to the tax collector who was taking a little bit off the top or adding more to the taxes needed, even though there was no more. The the Romans required a certain amount. The tax collectors would be like, well, let me get a little extra and I'll say that the Romans told me to um, receive this much. Hey, the Romans, I'm supposed to take 15%. You keep... Uh, and so what he, did, what he would do is he would give 10% to the Romans and he would keep five. That was corrupt. It was lying. And they felt bad. And so he says, don't do that. Go and do this instead. And then the lastly, the Roman soldiers were even convicted. So now the Romans are convicted by this message from John. So the Holy Spirit's working, right? God is working in this message. And now they're saying, what should we do? And he said, don't extort money, be just, be fair, and be content with the pay that you have. Prove that you have truly repented. This water is just a symbol that you have. It's a declaration in front of God, in front of everyone else. By the way, next week, it's the same thing. It's a symbol. It's a a demonstration of what's really going on in here and then how you live the rest of your life. My concern is, is that religion has taught people uh, over the years that if you do these routines, you're safe. John's confronting that right here saying, just because you belong to the line of Abraham doesn't mean you're safe. You must prove it by having a real changed heart, a truly changed heart. And it still speaks to us today. Now, verse 15 says, everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon. And they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. They're referring to the anointed one who would come save them and rescue them. And John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I love how John's so humble that he doesn't point at himself at all. He points right to Jesus. His message has always been, I decrease so that Christ may increase. Same thing with us. He was a humble man. Even by the way he dressed, he wasn't flashy. But now he's even saying, hey, I'm not the one you think. But what he does say is, is here's how you'll know the difference. The difference will be that you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit And so that's the difference between me and the Messiah. And we know that happened in Acts 2 when when Pentecost happened and the Holy Spirit came and baptized. That was Jesus. Jesus was baptizing the believers in the Spirit. And so that was the difference. And then he ends his sermon to them with these words. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork, verse 17. He's ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. John used many such warnings. This is kind of this kind of crapped me up when I read this again. He used many such warnings as he announced the good news. This is good news. <clears throat> Let me start there real quick. Why is this good news? Because it, there's still time. There's still time before the never-ending fire takes place and the judgment day comes. There's still time to repent and get ready for the, now for us in our time, the second coming of Christ. Do you see the, uh, the foreshadowing here of the future? Here was the first coming of the kingdom of God on earth. And so John's announcing, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. Well, now we're back full circle, and now we're waiting for Christ to come back one more time, and it's the same message we should have for everyone in our world. But here's what I'm learning, is that people are waking up even before we say anything. God is waking people up and getting their attention to come back to him. What is the winnowing fork in everything? Well, 
there's wheat. The wheat represents everyone who believes and has truly repented and made Jesus their Lord and Savior. And the chaff is those who have not. And what they would do is they would take the pitchfork and, and stab the wheat, throw it in the air, and so the wheat kernels would fall down to the ground and, they, and then they would collect those. But at the same time, most of the time, and at least the st- things I've seen and read, the wind would blow the useless shells and pieces in the air. It would blow it away and it would separate and they would take that pile up as well and burn it. So John is really pointing to the future of what's going to take place. And Jesus talks about this later in Matthew as well, separating the wheat from the weeds, that there's going to be a time where they're separated and one will burn and and be judged forever and then the other one will be judged and will be with God forever. And that's the wheat. John's love for people, well, first of all, for God and for people is so great, he's willing to warn them like this. That's the good news is that we still have time. Praise the Lord. Um, <clears throat> just so you know, Jesus preached the same thing. It wasn't just John who had to do it. He may not have done it as, as, you know, as gracious maybe as Jesus because he's human and Jesus is, is God and He's 100% grace and 100% truth, and, and we don't have that all figured out, so we do need to be careful how we communicate this in public and how we communicate to our friends, but we do need to speak the truth, amen? Well, Jesus did the same thing. Matthew 4, 17, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. We see in the early church the same thing. Peter says it on the day of Pentecost. This is what he actually This is what actually happens, verse 37, um, Acts 2, 37. Peter's words pierced their hearts because he had just preached a message and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? It's the same question. So John preaches a hard message and truth. They say, what do we do? Peter does it at the day of Pentecost. They say, what do we do? And this is his reply. Each of you must repent of your sins, turn away from them, and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is today. This era is after the cross, after the resurrection. We still have the same message. Now, I like how Paul says it too. He says, come back to God. So maybe that will help people understand. Come back to God. Come back to him. Come back to your creator, is who I, I've been telling everyone I can. God created you to be with him in fellowship. Sin has separated us from that. And then God goes and fixes it with Jesus Christ. He makes a way where there is no way. In the Old Testament, he makes a way where there is no way. In the New Testament, and it's Jesus Christ on the cross, and Jesus on the cross dying and rising again is is God's message, come back to me. I fixed everything. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Paul calls himself an ambassador, making his appeal, making God's appeal, and saying, We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And he finishes in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He says, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we can be made right with God through Christ. So for you who are an unbeliever today, come back to God. Are you watching online? Are you in this room? Do you know that sin has separated you from God, but he loves you so much that he sent his son down to this world to save you from your sin, to give you forgiveness. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, he makes you a brand new person. He no longer holds your sins against you and you are righteous in his eyes. The righteousness of Christ is imputed or now put on you and now you are righteous and holy in God's eyes. That's for you today. Amen. And he's calling you to believe in him, not trust and believe in your own works to get you to heaven because that doesn't work. Not to trust in your parents' salvation or your parents' belonging in a church. Kids, youth, young adults, your parents' 
faith in God does not save you, you must make a personal decision to believe in Jesus Christ yourself. You also have to admit that you are lost without Jesus, that you're lost in your sin, that you're a wanderer, and that you are found in Christ. You must acknowledge that yourself. And when we do, we find an amazing, gracious, forgiving God with his arms wide open, ready to welcome us home. That's the message, the good news. Well, as Christians and believers, we're not completely perfect yet, are we? And so we too must live out our repentance and walk in repentance as well. So this message is for us too. I'll give you a few examples of how we as believers, we need to be careful and we need to repent of things and turn back to God if we've gone wayward as well. Um, Apparently around the age of eight, I was like a little thief or something like that. I, I was like, I, I took some candy from a store. I took $5 out of my friend's um, clear container that stared at me every day when I was at his house. Just kept seeing this, this, uh, this $5 bill being pushed against this clear container and I coveted it and I wanted it and I took it. I took a friend's car. Man, I was a little heathen, wasn't I? I was like, <laughs> I know, yeah. A Tootsie Roll bar from a store where I get my hair cut at as a kid. I still remember that. Well, apparently, Pastor John, he was preaching the word that day at kids' church because I got convicted. And I went home, and my parents are already taking a nap because after church, you're exhausted as a pastor. You use a lot of energy, and they had to go back to church that night, and so they're taking a nap, and I'm scared to interrupt my dad's nap. He's like a bear in a cave, hibernating. You don't mess with that. So I have that circumstance on top of me just being, you know, really embarrassed. And, and I, felt, I felt the conviction of God, though. And so I went to my dad, and I'm like, <laughs> he's probably like, get it out, son. And I tell him, I took this, I stole this, I stole this, I stole that. I think my dad's eyes was got, he was more and more awake. Oh my goodness. And I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done. And what I found was a loving, cuddly bear. <laughs> no. I found the forgiveness of God in that moment. But then my dad didn't stop there because we believe in the restitution of our sins and making things right. And that's what was taught to the people back then in this time we're reading in. And it's taught to us today, if it's possible to make things right with someone, to make amends, we should do it. And so my dad said, I want you to go return the things that you've stolen. And we're going to go to the store and we're going to pay those for that candy you stole. And uh, another time, one time, I popped a bunch of holes in bread um, at IGA in in Rodney Village. You remember that? And I got in deep trouble. There was no sparing the rod on that week. (laughs) And, uh, but in both situations, something beautiful happened I didn't realize until I got older. I couldn't pay those things back because I can never pay for my sin. I can never make amends enough for my sin. I could apologize. I could go confess it to those people, what I've done. And that's what I did. And I found forgiveness at every place, by the way, even from a secular person working at a a haircut place. But what happened was my dad paid for everything. And it hit me later on in life that that's exactly what God does for you. You can't afford to pay it, but God pays it for you. (laughs) Praise the Lord. I was forgiven by the the woman at the hair parlor, and I was forgiven by my dad. I was forgiven by my friend. Why would I go and do that again? I never stole from them again. I never returned to that sin. Praise the Lord. I think one time I actually walked out of a restaurant with a, with a butter knife inside my takeout container, and that was about it. 
And I think I'm pretty sure I took that back because I felt so bad. <laughs> That's how much I was convicted by that day. But can I encourage you real quick? Just so you know, you could never fix your sin. You could never pay enough back. The Father did it for you by sending his son, Jesus Christ. We're preaching the cross before we ever get to Easter Sunday right now. Jesus loves you that much. It doesn't matter how much you've sinned, he will forgive you. But the key is you have to turn back. You have to repent. You have to see your wrong. Isaiah 55, six through seven. It won't be on the screen, but I'm gonna read it to you. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. If people would just turn to God, they're gonna find mercy. And then we as a church must also show that mercy, amen? And we're gonna get into that in this series. But the, the last part I love, yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. Real quick, uh, a brother in Christ messaged me after our giving sermon a few weeks ago and he said, I'm pledging my tithe this year. Apparently he wasn't tithing and now he's committed to tithing. You know what that is? That's repentance. Not giving to God and his ministry and his work and now he's giving to the Lord. That's repentance. I got a message from a young lady who moved away from here a few years ago and she, she messaged me. Uh, I was working on my sermon and I was taking a break, a lunch break and, and I get a message online and I look at it and she says, Ryan, I don't know who else to turn to, but I feel terrible for what I've done. I'm not living right. What do I do? I'm reading this scripture as she messages me this. And I tell her, repent, turn back to God because that's God, God's love convicting you for your sin to get your attention and to come back to him. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. This is, this is a, a healthy guilt, a conviction from the Lord that you're not living right. So I checked on her this week just to make sure. She said, Ryan, I moved out of my boyfriend's house because I was living in sin and I'm reading my Bible every day. Praise Jesus. You see, she wasn't just sorry with her mouth. She was sorry with her actions. Why would God do that? Because he has a good jealousy for you. He loves you. He wants all of you. He created you. He made you. He wants a relationship with you and any kind of sin in your life will stop you from having a proper relationship with you. And he's calling us home to be with him, whether you're unsaved and even us as believers, if we've gone wayward, come back because you're gonna find a merciful God and a merciful church. We wanna help you through it. But let me be clear, there must be true repentance, not a return to sin. And again, we will help through that because we wanna show how God is, is oh man, his love. He's so patient with us, it's, it's insane. I mean, he's not insane, he's not crazy. We are for continuing to return to it. His grace is so good. He's gonna give you the ability to stop. And lastly, to, re to apply this to our own life, we can be like John, Peter, and Paul by preparing for people, preparing people for the second coming, by getting them right with the Lord now first encouraging them to come back to God, showing them the mercy of God, encouraging them to, to keep an eye on the world. And do you know Jesus is gonna come back one day and take all of his believers with him? Are you aware of that? If you're not, let me tell you about that message. Let me tell you what the scripture says, because these signs that we're seeing in our world right now, we have a heads up. I wanna, I wanna preach on that when it comes time. I don't wanna rush into it yet. But right now you can tell people, hey, keep your eyes open what's going on, but let me tell you how, why you need to. There's a lot of scripture pointing to what's happening right now in our day. It's been going on for years. You know, the last days has been ever since 
the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. That was one of the first prophecies fulfilled for the last days. So it's been over 2,000 years. We may be in the last hour, or last minutes. And what's happening is, is God's shaking the world and people are looking up and looking around and going, where do I go? What do I do? Because this is crazy. We can be the ones who help. How would you help someone get ready? Help them understand Christ. Talk to people about Jesus and what he said about these events. Talk to them about what he did on the cross for them. Share this sermon, pass it on. You can go to our YouTube channel this week and pass this sermon on. Say, I love you. I want you to know the truth. Check this out from my pastor. You can do that if you want. We'll help with that. But right now, let us respond right now. Amen. Would you stand with me? Today, as believers, we can be sorry but can I encourage you to go walk out that repentance and clean some things up and prepare yourself for the coming of Christ, the second coming, when he gathers us up as wheat. He gathers us up to be with him forever. Would you prepare yourself? Let's close our eyes together. Lord, begin to convict, begin to correct, begin to show us where we need to change. As believers, Lord, sin that we are participating in and things that we're doing that we shouldn't, Lord, we want to be pure and spotless before you, God. And if you need to come down here for prayer, I'll have our ministry team ready to pray right now. Why don't my ministry team come down? Any of our prayer team, if you need prayer, we want to pray with you. It could be for anything at this point. But you can also respond where you are too. If you are someone who has not believed in that message of the gospel, the good news that we've learned today, and you feel that emptiness and that, and as well as that, the pain of that sin, that is God convicting you, helping you to see it. And now is a time not to harden your heart, but to stay soft and turn back to him right now. And come to him and ask God to forgive you because he does, but you must confess it and acknowledge it yourself that he does forgive you. Would you say that online right now or in this room? Lord, forgive me. I come to you because you offer forgiveness, you offer mercy, and I am wrong and I am in sin and I'm sorry. And I come to you for salvation. Help me to live a different life. I walk in repentance. I turn away from these things. What's gonna happen, my friend, is the Holy Spirit's gonna come into your life and change the way you live. He's gonna help you. Thank the Lord for that, amen. And church, we we can, we can keep our eyes, like we can, we can look at all the signs and stuff like that, but we need to keep our eyes on Jesus right now. And we need to understand that while the the cloud is up in the air, there's people on the ground suffering and needing hope and needing good news. And they are hurting because of their sin. And so we have good news that they are forgiven and there's mercy for them. And so let's prepare the way for the Lord's coming again. And let's be ready, church. Let us be ready by walking in repentance so that we can actually preach the word. So we can do it like John did and he lived a righteous life so he could preach that. <clears throat> he could encourage our, his friends and his fellow man to, to come back to God. Lord, we don't just say we're sorry. We show it by changing the way we live. And Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit that gives us a new heart and new mind to go do what pleases you, to go live out your desires according to your word in Philippians 2.13. God, thank you for convicting my friend who messaged me and convicting me and convicting others, God, to change our ways because you love us and a, and a father who loves us disciplines his children. God, we thank you for the gospel, the good news that when we couldn't fix our sin, you did. When we couldn't afford to pay for it with our life, you gave your son instead of us. Thank you for that. We celebrate that. And God, in view of your mercy, we offer our lives as living sacrifices, 
holy and pleasing to you, God. And God, for those in this room who think they can't be holy, God, fix that right now in Jesus' name. We can be holy. That's a lie from the devil. You have made us holy upon salvation. You have sanctified us by your spirit. We can live holy, God. That's a lie. We clear the road right now. We prepare the way right now with that lie. God, and we get rid of it right now in Jesus' name. From the pits of hell, that is not true. We can live holy, God. Because you are holy, you've called us to be holy. God, you will satisfy all of our needs according to your riches and glory, Lord. You will give us true joy instead of us seeking our happiness. You will fill us with true joy, with true contentment. God, you will give us much more than we could ever think or imagine, Lord. God, we abandon our selfish desires. We abandon our selfish ways, God, to take on your way of life because your way is better than ours. There is no human relationship that will satisfy. There is no physical thing of this world that will satisfy. Only Jesus Christ satisfies us. Only Jesus Christ can make us whole. So God, heal the brokenness today in this room. Heal the brokenness online, Lord God. God, we ask you to save us from our pain and our hurt. But most of all, save us from our sin that has caused that. God, we, we, we at times live with no peace in our hearts and that's because we have not repented yet. Church, let me break from this prayer for a moment to tell you, in Matthew 11, when Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Do you know that before that he says, repent? Do you want rest for your soul? Do you want to walk in freedom? It's freedom to repent. Jesus called them to repent before he said that. And he's saying, come to me because you're living under the weight of your sin and burdened by the, the laws that won't save and all the rules you're trying to follow. You're burdened by that. And Jesus came to set you free from it. And his yoke is easy. His burden is light. Why? Because he is under there carrying it with you. He will help you live a holy life. He will give you freedom. He is calling you today as believers to quit looking anywhere else but Jesus to give you true joy, true rest, true peace. And unfortunately, we don't turn away from those things that we need to that are causing the conflict in us as it is. So Lord, we turn away from those things too. As I said last year, or last week, God, we are here for you, God. We are here for you because we know only you can satisfy. God, we want you over everything else in this world. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing today. Thank you for the salvation. Thank you, God, that you are working in us to turn away from things that we could even be afraid of because we don't know what life's gonna be like when we turn away from it. But God, you are so good. Our future is good when we're following you. So God, I, I rebuke all the fear and all the lies that we can't do this because it's not true. You are right there with us to go live this life. And Lord, prepare us as we prepare others, Lord, to be ready for your return. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Glory to God. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God.